CT was famous for telling us that if you ask people to give up hate, then you have to be there for them when they do. And the first time CT told me that, I cursed under my breath. And it was definitely under my breath because you can't curse a minister, right? <laughs> And I didn't quite understand him because I was very comfortable hating the Klan. I mean, a black woman can't hate the Klan, who's left? I mean. <laughs> but once I got to see their humanity, I saw how right CT was. If the people who see their pain don't offer them grace, don't offer them understanding and, and the necessary bit of patience and empathy, then you're basically seeing them as disposable people and you just leave them out there to be even more radicalized. So, Loretta, we wanted to talk about cancel culture mm -hmm. and what your, what your thoughts are on cancel culture. It seems like, um, you know, people are being canceled at a faster and faster rate at the moment. Well... The whole concept of cancel culture and woke culture started off in the black community as part of our young black vernacular. And of course it's migrated to the mainstream and it's gotten weaponized by the right. Um, but there is a question of whether or not we're too quick to judge each other and whether or not we are capable of giving each other the benefit of the doubt and stuff like that, but let's be clear that this is not something that is new. I mean, the original definition of a call out was killed Alexander Hamilton. So it isn't right. like this is something that's totally fresh because of the internet mm -hmm. or, or that, that perception. Our, our history as a country is replete with examples of canceling people like the Salem witch hunts and uh, you know, the, the monitoring of Hollywood rating systems and getting movies and things like that canceled because they didn't meet decency standards that some people wanted to be met. And we still have that today over people complaining about the Harry Potter movies or the Passion of Christ and stuff like that. So cancel culture has been with us for as long as humanity has had opinions on things. So I wouldn't attributed so, to the 21st century so much as it just goes faster now because we have the internet. You know, we, we, um, there is a reason that pe people should be called out. So what is, the, what is the proper process in your mind for how you might um, you know, correct something that's inconsistent with our values? What's a, what, how do you teach that to people? Because maybe it's gone too far, but, but what's the proper response and the proper process for thinking about it? Well, for me, the call out should be your last resort, not the first resort. You can, have a, you can actually seek to have a conversation with the person and ask them to achieve accountability through civil discourse. You can perhaps even not worry about what you think they're doing wrong, given that we were all stupid teenagers at some point, and we all did a lot of stupid things back then. And so you can let, you can give a pass. Just because you think someone is doing something wrong, it doesn't mandate that you have to intervene or, or seek accountability unless you are a self-righteous warrior, that kind of thing. But there is an appropriate use of the call out, I think, when people aren't being accountable for the way they abuse their power over other people, when people are hypocrites, when they are saying one thing and doing another, uh, when people don't want to admit that their actions or behaviors are causing harm to others. And instead of acknowledging that they've made a mistake and promising to do better, they double down and they insist that they should be able to do whatever they want to do without any consideration of the harm that they do to others. So those are the appropriate uses of calling out and canceling for me, but I like to use them in reserve. They're not my first choice, they're my last choice because I like to keep the humanity of the people in front of my vision as I'm trying to evaluate what my next steps are. Um, civil discourse, you know, you mentioned civil discourse, but we sort of exist at a time where I don't see much of that. I don't see much of people 
sitting down to discuss um, their differences or their issues. Um, and I think there's a, obviously a difference between criminality and, and you know, correcting somebody for something that we, you know, we don't agree with in terms of our values, but how do you see it? Like, how do you see that the beginnings of those processes of how we, we talk to one another? I'm not sure if there's an easy answer. I mean, we have a political divide where one set of people are trying to use intelligence and reason and the other people are using superstition. I mean, I'm not sure if there's a common ground. Although that's a very old thing too. Well, that's true too, but I'm talking about superstition based on who won the election. I mean, we're talking about observable, provable facts that people don't want to believe in. It, you know, it's kind of like the flat earth theorist. I mean, how do you find common ground if you're a physics professor with someone who believes that the earth is flat? There is no common ground there. Right. Well, okay. So, I mean, I guess people who believe in the enlightenment and people who don't, you know, it, I mean, seems like a very old thing, but it's, you know, how do we, because we are going to be living here together. How do we how do we find common ground or how do we how do we think about it? Like what's the process for for coming to a shared understanding of, of the way the world is? Well, I find that when I'm dealing with people who don't share my political perspectives, I try to go underneath their words and speak to their values, because quite often we can have some value agreement, even if we land on different strategies for what to do about our values. And that can sometimes create a common ground conversation. Uh, I may have a different definition of freedom than someone who's on the right. For example, my definition of freedom may be freedom from injustice and racism and sexism. And their definition is the freedom not to wear a mask. I mean, so we're dealing with totally different definitions of freedom here. <laughs> so how do you find but, that? How do but, you find that cam common value then? then well, I mean, because, well in, in that case, you're talking about cognitive dissonance. I mean, what yeah. reason could you have to not wear a mask? So there's there's some cognitive dissonance. There's something deeper at work underneath all that, no? Absolutely, because when I think of cognitive dissonance, I think of the fact that most people think that they're better people inside than their behavior can sometimes display. And that's the misalignment that drives a lot of them to the call out culture. And so one of the ways that I'm gonna always try to work is to really work with that interior good opinion of themselves. Uh, for example, I'll just ask somebody, you know, I know you well enough to know that you'd rush into a burning building to save somebody and you wouldn't care what race they were, or what gender they were. If you could, you'd walk into that building and save them. So how am I supposed to align that good man that I know you are with the words that just came out of your mouth? Help me understand. And in that way, I'm reaffirming their interior good opinion and asking them to make a reconciliation between those two parts without calling them in or out. You assume the best of what that a human can offer in that moment and see how a person might rise or not to that? Like, how do you... What happens when you do that? Well, I mean, when I was the director of the DC Rape Crisis Center back in the 70s, we had a black feminist education program for men who were incarcerated who had murdered and raped women. And I was able to see the good in them. Most of them had been violated themselves as children, preconditioning them to violate other people. Uh, when I worked with Reverend Vivian, at the National Anti-Klan Network. It was part of my job was to deprogram people who'd been in the hate movement, in the Klan and the neo-Nazi movement. And you superficially, people would say that there's nothing redeemable about people who walk around in swastikas or Klan robes, but in fact, they thought of themselves as good people, thought of themselves as doing the right thing. It's kind of ironic. The first thing someone in a clan room tells you is that they're not a racist. They're just working for the good of their people kind of approach. And so if you pay attention to that good opinion of themselves inside, you'll probably make much more headway than if you just say, I'm going to dismiss you because you've done this or you look like this or you sit in this social location or you're wearing that 
you know, offensive outfit. So I'm not you're... saying that you can call on people in a different way than just reacting to what you think you know about them. You know, when you sit down with somebody who's been deeply involved with the Klan, like how do you, how, what's that first meeting like? Well, first of all, let's be clear. They don't even approach a conversation with a person like me until they've already had their own internal epiphany. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, that, that's Hollywood myth that, that we could go inside the hate movement and flip somebody and, you know, one conversation with a black woman is going to forever change. That's just done in Hollywood, right. it's not real, reality. But once we do sit down and have those conversations, you really get an idea of what made them who they are. There's always, almost always intense alienation from their families or from their communities. Many of the men speak about having been bullied as children. And yet when they put on that Nazi swastika, instead of them being afraid, everybody became afraid of them. I mean, so there's quite human things happening behind those roles, behind those insignia. And that if you ask them to tell you more, you'll find out some astonishing things that aren't surprising if you do it enough times and you see this very familiar pattern of the recruitment of alienated bruised souls into the hate movement. That's very predictable. Very so, few people have satisfying lives and they end up in the hate movement. Do you have to be in repose to hear those things? Do you have to be listening and not saying what you think? Yeah, I call it using your mental parking lot, putting those things, those normal, your normal reactions and your desire to clap back at them in your mental parking lot so that you can pay close and loving attention to what they're saying. And, and even if you don't think it's the truth, accept that that is their truth. And so in that way, you can sometimes help them affirm that they wanna be good people and help them understand how to be good people from here on. Now, what did you learn from CT about these things? CT was famous for telling us that if you ask people to give up hate, then you have to be there for them when they do. And the first time CT told me that, I cursed under my breath. And it was definitely under my breath because you can't curse a minister, right? <laughs> and I didn't quite understand him because I was very comfortable hating the Klan. I mean, like I said, if a black woman can't hate the Klan, who's left? I mean, <laughs> your hate list is really short. Right. And so what, but once I got to see their humanity, I saw how right CT was, that if the people who see their pain don't offer them grace, don't offer them understanding and, and the necessary bit of patience and empathy, then you're basically seeing them as disposable people. And you just leave them out there to be even more radicalized. Because the problem with their recruiters in the hate movement is that they don't sincerely care about these people. They just care about swell, you know, swelling up their ranks and exploiting them and things. And so they offer a, fa a, a false empathy. And so if you match that with the real thing, you can actually help them rethink their choices in their lives. You don't actually change people when you talk to them. You offer them options so that they can change themselves. Do you remember the first time you sat down with a, a really hardcore rapist in jail? Rapist or racist? Well, <laughs> well, the, the, well in the 70s, you oh, know, yeah. when you first started this mm -hmm. work, you know? And and oh you know, absolutely, I feel I remember that. And and what was that like? I mean, just when because I imagine when you're first sitting down, I mean, I mean, this is somebody who's committed evil acts and you're trying to find a you're, you're trying to find something forward with a person who may never get out of jail that, that, you know, you're trying to find that sliver of humanity. Like, how did that, how did that work? And what was it like internally for you? Well, first of all, I'd never been in a prison before. And so I was working in Lorton Reformatory, which was DC's jail at the time down in rural Virginia. And so my first traumatic engagement was just being, searched, it's an almost strip search by the guards getting into the jail. 
just making sure that I wasn't smuggling something in, into, into the prisoners. And the first person I met with was named William Fuller because he was the one that had written the letter that caught our attention because his letter basically said, outside I raped women, inside I raped men and I'd like not to be a rapist anymore. Apparently William had gone to prison at age 17 for raping and murdering a black woman. And by this time he was in his mid thirties. And so he had gotten his GED, taught himself to read, I mean, to read some black philosophy and apparently some black feminist literature, which is what caused him to write the DC Rape Crisis Center. The other thing that surprised me once I got into the prison with William and the five other men that he had organized into this group called Prisoners Against Rape was how big and intimidating they were. They were like MMA people. And it took me years to process that the way, the reason that, that they were the prison predators because they spent all their time buffing up so that they didn't become the prey. Right. So it was quite scary to be surrounded by six huge men, yeah. huge men. And the only thing I knew how to do at that time was just start telling my own rape story. Wait, what do you mean your own rape story? Do you mind telling that or? or... Oh, no, I don't mind telling that. Uh, the reason I was at the Rape Crisis Center as its director was because I was a survivor of several rapes. Uh, one at age 11 when I was kidnapped from a Girl Scout camp and uh, raped in the woods and fortunately survived that. And then at 14, I experienced incest at the hands of a cousin and ended up having a baby through that and co-parenting with my rapist for four decades. And then I was gang raped when I was 16, my first year in college, because I naively followed a guy who said he was going to take me to a party. And it turns out he took me to a gang rape. So all I could do was tell my stories. And then what that did was give them permission in a strange way to tell their own. And a couple of them were very comfortable in talking about what they had experienced and what they were doing. But there were a couple of them who said, this is the first time I've ever said this to anybody. Even these guys I'm in here with don't know that this happened to me. And I have to honestly say, once I went from seeing them as rapists and seeing them as human beings, my fear w went away. Um, we kept, we kept, so every Friday I would come back and bring, you know, black literature, the destruction of black civilization, for example, uh, those kind of books to them. Cause my, I felt that teaching them black feminist theory and education and black history would be one small contribution I could make to their lives. But we also had pretty strong and stringent ground rules that I wasn't going to ever bring them anything into the prison, no cigarettes, no tennis shoes, nothing like that. I wasn't going to write any letters to the parole board to get them out early because I didn't want the rape crisis center to be used in that way. But if they were willing to accept knowledge, I was willing to provide it. And, and did that, you know, that moment after you told your story and it was silent, you know, what, what was going through your mind before, the, before William started to volunteer his information? Well, I did feel safe. I mean, I'm in a... But, but know, not even safe, just you don't know that anything's going to even come out of this or whether they're even hearing you. So, yeah. so what's that, that first, you know, sort of moment where it becomes, okay, this was worth my time. There's, a, the, this is, there's something good can happen here. Well, William was obviously the leader of the pack because he's the one that spoke up first. Um, and once he started telling his story, then others started chiming in and, and telling their story. No one broke down into tears or anything like that. Uh, because I don't know if there's some code about not crying or whatever. But the other thing that I should probably bring into this conversation was that at the Rape Crisis Center, we were getting a, an increased number of calls from male victims because there apparently was some kind of gang initiation where older gangs of boys would attack younger boys as a way of proving whatever they thought 
proved about their manhood. And so I wasn't totally startled when they started talking about, you know, male on male rape, because this was affecting our hotline calls as well. And um, and so they start, they they eventually just started sharing what had happened to them. Most of them were violated by other men, but not exclusively. Some of them were violated by women as well. And all of them understood that it wasn't about sex. It was really about power. Right. And they were very clear on that, uh, okay. that that was the way they kept themselves safe in prison. Yeah. And that's how they kind of dealt with the whole sexual assault issue. What was kind of interesting, and I wish I'd been smart enough, I was 25 at the time, so I wasn't like, had studied anything or knew what I know now. But what was interesting was they all denied that they were gay. So they really separated having sex with men with embracing being gay. And for them, it was really about power. It wasn't about the sex at all. And I wish I'd known more to probe that more back then, but I didn't know to ask that question. But was that the foundation for you of, you know, that willing, first of all, for you to just be so open. And now when we think about again, you know, calling people out or whatever, your 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 instinct first is to go or your methodology is you go in and try to understand what is going on, right? Just so and and is people talk about under the other and trying to you know, walk in someone else's shoes or try to, how to dialogue with people. And so is that a skill that, you know, where did you get your, your strength and your, you know, how did you learn how to be able to even go in and do that coming through? Those were not, you know, those seem not like great, you know, circumstances or, or events that you had to go through. That just does not sound. Well, I mean, obviously I wouldn't be around if I hadn't gotten some professional therapy at some point or, <laughs> You know, so that always, I always have to attribute some of my growth and learning through, you know, professionals who know how to work on trauma and, and mental health and stuff like that. So I'll never discount them. But I was always the, the questioning kid anyway, growing up in, in my household with my mom and dad. Or I always wanted to know more than the world apparently was making available to me. <laughs> I was a kid that, you know, had 20 books checked out of the library at the same time, most of which were overdue kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or I probably am the only person that ever flunked Sunday school in my church. Wait, why? Wait, Wait, you flunked it? Well, I, they didn't have pass out grades, but they certainly had problems with me. Because I remember them telling me the biblical story of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. And I followed it to a point, I could understand it to a point, but then at some point in the story, they told me that Cain and Abel got married. Now, up until that point, I only thought there were four human beings on the earth. So who did Cain and Abel marry? I kept asking him because the math wasn't working out for me. <laughs> I was nine years old and I said, something's wrong, did they marry their mother? I mean, what happened? <laughs> okay, so you you almost flunked for asking for being curious and that piercing. It, yes. it had to it had to make sense to me for yeah. me to accept it. I had no problems accepting things that made sense, but every once in a while there'd be a back that up and tell me who can enable Mary. Yeah. Were there more women than the Bible says so far? I mean, what's going on? So is that is that the quality that that you know sees the similarity between the rapist, the racist, and and woke culture that that is always probing that line? Is that come from that that early little girl who's saying, "What is this?" You know, does it all tie back to that? Well, I think so, but I actually think that it's also how I want it to change. I mean, I'm probably the only person in the world that wrote an advice book for myself. Because <laughs> most right. advice books are for everybody else, right? You're telling everybody else what to do. Well, I was the call out queen. Right. I was really busy uh, criticizing people for who they were or what they did. And particularly if they hurt me, I was just all over them. 
Mm -hmm. If I had imagined the hurt, but if they hurt me, I was all over them. And I didn't like who I'd become. That judgmental jump down their throat. And then most times, the call outs would backfire because here I am calling out someone who I'm, you know, who either hurt me or I imagined that hurt me. And then the elders around me would look more side eyed at me than the person that I was calling out. And I didn't like that. I felt like I was disappointing them because people have invested in me and I didn't like what I was becoming using that call out strategy. And so that's where I really started interrogating it. How, how determining how I wanted to walk through the world, how I wanted to deal with harm and hurt and pleasure and activism, because that's also part of it. I mean, if you're not having fun fighting the righteous fight for human rights, you're doing something wrong. And um, I found that I was taking away my own joy. So you had to shed something and then get something to go forward. Exactly. I had to shed my quick temper, my rush to judgment, my belief that there's a perfect way to do activism or the right word to use when you're talking about a situation. Uh, getting out of the woke competition, just totally giving up on the woke competition. And those were things that I had to unlearn for myself before I could offer any teaching to anybody else about how do you do it. Now, did you see that with Andrew Young and some of these other people who were in the community who had, who had done oh, those yeah. kinds of things? Oh, yeah. One of the beauties of working with Reverend Vivian or CT, like he liked us to call him. I know he told you to call me CT because that, that was him. He was that humble. Was that in his company, I got to meet all the icons of the civil rights movement, whether it was Ralph David Abernathy or Andrew Young or, you know, Joseph Lowry. And he used to tell me about how they used to fight like hell behind closed doors, but they managed to present a united front in the face of Jim Crow segregation. Yeah. And so it wasn't that they didn't have their issues. They thought that the cause was bigger than the fights that they had with each other. And anybody that's read any of the histories written about the civil rights movement, a lot of the, the people of those days didn't anoint Martin Luther King as their leader. They had a lot of problems with him. As a matter of fact, it was Reverend Vivian, I think, that told me that there was a reason that only John Lewis went to the Selma, to the uh, to the to, to the Selma march to the bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, because they didn't disagree. They didn't agree that that should be done at that time. But you have no evidence of that 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 fight in the records and stuff. I think I saw it read. I think he wrote about it in his in his you know, book that was released posthumously. But no. You know, you see a lot of those, that, that philosophical sort of idea come about in Birmingham, where, you know, like we talk about Selma, but in a way, Selma's already, a, you know, we know what's going to happen in Selma. In Birmingham, everybody just thinks they're going to die. You know, they're going deep into the South, right at the, the, the heart of the thing. And, and their philosophy is not to, to you know, fight you know, uh, in, in a direct way, they're, they're working with the business leaders to actually force them to get to the change that they want to achieve. And is that a thing about how we, we think about social change is that we have to have some conceptual underpinning of what we're trying to do? Yeah, as a matter of fact, since the murder of George Floyd last year, there's been a whole lot of call out culture around whether or not someone just putting up a Black Lives Matter sign is doing enough. Or, you know, when the NFL paints the field, is it enough? And I'm really offering people a chance to say that this is an opportunity that we can build upon. So even if they don't mean to do more, the fact that they did it at all means, number one, they're not on the other side. Number two, they are providing an opportunity for us. And number three, we need to let go of our judgmentalism so that we don't leave that opportunity sitting on the table because we have this opinion about how right, what else they should be doing. You have these opportunities for transformative conversations if you can let go of your arrogance about what you think somebody else should be doing. 
you know, v voting in these upcoming elections, you know, we're, we're not there yet, but, but like, how do we keep a united force, a united, you know, it, it, it seems like it, we're splintering a little bit at the moment, you know? I think it was E.J. Dion that wrote in the Washington Post that the Republicans organize for power and Democrats organize for fights. Right. <laughs> I think that's where we are right now. But yeah. we'll see. We'll see because it's kind of hard to see the Republican Party as a legitimate political party because it's acting too much like a cult right now yeah. with no policy ideas. You know, all they all they only define but what they hate, not what they're for. And that's a pretty that is is like you're in a battle of wits with the unarmed. What are we supposed to do with that? Mm. And so so it's really important, I think, for people who oppose that slide towards authoritarianism that that party represents with this cult-like practices to keep our eyes on the prize that our democracy is teetering on a very dangerous precipice right now. And we need to make sure that we do everything in our power to even protect liberal democracy, but also advance it because we never quite perfected this democratic experiment. Otherwise we wouldn't have had a Black Lives Matter movement. Exactly. Or a women's you, movement. You know, in the beginning of our conversation just now, you said that, you know, in the beginning, this sort of calling out was against power or powerful people that were, you know, there were other leaders that were keeping it really doing horrendous things and really invoking a horrible uh, language and, in, and inciting, you know, really kind of violence towards certain groups of people. We know that. But then how do we, and that was where the sort of the call out comes from, like, this is not okay. Now we're in a situation where I think I was just reading, there's a, there's a law about to be passed that if you find, if you get somebody off social media for lying or for, you know, what misinformation, you're going to be fined. Did you both read this? Like $25,000? No. This is a law that kind yeah. of passed. I think it's in text. I, somebody keep me honest here, but they're, they're, and this is sort of this reaction, but yet we do need to keep calling out the powers that, like you say, well, that the, like, and yet it's, it's causing, you know, What's happening is the right wing kind of it's just taking this sort of quote cancel culture and then ripping that and saying cc so what do we do in this kind of situation where it's like a battle and then everything's happening online right so we can't what are we any wisdom <laughs> any thoughts around how do we keep a sane approach towards you know a <coughs> being accountable but i mean calling things out when when or at least trying to say this this it may not be the right way to be i i don't really know how do we I, I it's very perplexing to me i didn't well i try not to, to to dance on the light fantastic as we used to say in the 60s you know just because the other people are tripping you have you have a choice about whether you're going to join them out there uh right now the right wing is doing things that are just unthinkable in my opinion for example, passing laws that it's okay to mow down protesters with your car. I mean, excuse me, that used to be vehicular homicide. And you're yeah. suddenly writing that as okay if it's done for the right political reasons. Exactly. I mean, so it, it, it's hard for me to get any purchase in people who literally are devoting themselves to alternative facts. And they are okay living in that Alice in Wonderland world. And so... I really don't even spend a whole lot of time trying to call them in. I want to organize the people who don't believe in that. First of all, more people voted for Biden than voted for Trump. And I do believe that even the people who voted for Trump have a soft underbelly. They don't want to be lunatics. They don't want to be seen as crazy. They don't want to be seen as flat earthers. But they have not been provided a pathway back to sanity, back to reasonableness and stuff like that. And so eventually, if we build our power with the people who already agree that gravity exists and help them and bring more people into the fold who thought that they were voting for one thing, but they ended up getting a con man and bring them in. And then we can use that amass power to overwhelm the people who are proud to be white supremacists, proud to be proud boys, proud to be you know, QAnon people. 
they are not a majority of, of even the Republican Party, but they have a disproportionate influence over them. And so I think that the way for us to do is not try to convince the Proud Boys or the Boogaloo Boys, but to go for the people who are actually repelled by them. You know, um, you, you've taught at, you know, Hampshire, you're teaching at this school now, you know, you've had these incredibly opinionated, uh, strong-willed students, these, cri these critical minds, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, and I'm sure they're selecting your class, they sort of come in with some strong opinions, you know, what, what's that like, and how do you, how do you shape, how do you bring people to a deeper understanding without telling them what it is? Well, I love teaching young people, that's, you know, teaching is my third career. I retired in 2012 and then became a teacher. So I'm doing it because I love it, not because I'm, I must do it or anything. I'm really proud to be doing it. But these young people are so unbelievably smart. And so I'm awed by that. And when I take, teach them about calling in, they all like heave this huge sigh of relief because they thought, through social media, that the way to be a human rights activist was to always be on guard and always jump down other people's throats and make sure you don't ever wear the wrong t-shirt in case somebody jumps on you and, you know, and stay silent so that you don't become the next target. I mean, they had really been living a life on verbal eggshells and, uh, they are so relieved when they say, you don't have to do that. Not only do you not have to do that, it's not even helpful to build a human rights movement. You're, you're doing the right thing the wrong way. And they love hearing that. And then the other thing that I offer them is the toggle switch. You need to be able to turn your consciousness on and off. You don't have to do a critical feminist analysis of Twilight. You can just watch the movie, you know, <laughs> and, and actually have fun in life. And so that's the other thing they don't know. They think that once you're woke and once you're conscious, then you, can, you have to be that way all the time. And you, they end up being Debbie Downers. People start moaning when they come into a room because the next thing you know, they're going to be calling everybody out for having wow. a beefsteak or something. And so they actually like the fact that they can chill, that they don't have to be on all the time, that they don't have to be so judgmental with each other. Uh, that they can learn the art of forgiveness and not be afraid of a tweet that they said when they were 14, blowing up their lives 10 years later, yeah, which yeah. is of course still happening. But so I love teaching the young people because, and they're so inventive and creative and, and naturally intersectional. Yeah. Because yeah. what's funny about young people is that they're the greatest skeptics in the world. Because they know 90% of what they read over the internet is a lie. It's the boomers like me who get who fall prey to the scams because we're so used to believing Walter Cronkite. You know, yes, oh my God. God. we're <laughs> wired to believe the news. We're wired to believe what we read. Uh, that's young people. Yeah. So that's a great, you know, I do have a, you just said something so beautiful, the verbal eggshells, which I, is an incredible way to think of it. Is that because these, this generation, these kids, young people in college, they have grown up with not one sort of, you're right, like one source or three sources. And so they're, you know, you, you might step on something inadvertently. Is, is that what that is? I mean, what, is, where do you think that comes from? That is a very different thing than, you know, I'm a boomer. So like, it's a different we grew up differently. So is it, is that part of why we're so hypersensitive, this, this group is so hypersensitive? Well, they know that people are curating their personalities online. They just know that what they're seeing online is not the truth about everybody. And, and so, and then they're in this attention culture so that they know that in order to get the necessary clicks or likes or whatever, you have to become more and more outrageous, more and more Whatever, you know, the, the hyper, the hyper visibility, the hyper acting, the histrionics, they know the game. And so they are not the ones most vulnerable to it in, a, in an interesting way. Now, there are people who are vulnerable to it who are young. That's why we see an increase in youth suicides because of the calling out that's happening. 
and stuff like that. And the radicalization is happening online. So there are people who are vulnerable to it. But for the most part, young people have a much more skeptical view of social media than even their parents do. Loretta, um, for people that are watching, you know, and if we could just leave them, you know, leave them with a thought about, you know, what to do in that moment, you know, just that little phrase that you sort of tell yourself, like, instead of suddenly calling out, maybe calling in or think twice, or if there's just anything, because we want people to think about, you know, we want people to really be processing and thinking about things and, and just any words of, of wisdom or advice, you can just a thought you can give us. Well, I guess I can only offer them the practice that I'm using for myself. Before I say the first thing that pops into my mind, I take a deep breath. And then I decide whether or not I'm, I, feel I need to say what I want to say. What do I want to achieve by saying it? And since you actually don't have the power to change other people magically, you know, whether or not it brings me joy to say it. And if it doesn't bring me joy, if it doesn't look like it's going to work, if it doesn't look like I'm putting my best foot forward, then I, that deep breath allows me to make that calculation and decide whether I'm going to call somebody out, call somebody in, or call on them just to be a better person. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Everything and for sharing, just being so open and sharing your life, some of the things that in your life and uh, the work that you have done for a very, very long time and hopefully will continue to do. So everyone who is watching or listening, please explore more about Loretta's work, her writings, and think about kind of what she's saying right now. I'm gonna take a deep breath. Please Thank do. you, Loretta, very much. Appreciate bye it. Bye-bye, y'all. Thank bye. you so much.